there, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, I'm Catherine Williams in the Classics Department, and um, I am here at a joint event. Uh, I'm representing the Institute for Classical Medieval Studies, and Mark Gallimore represents, and there are others here as well, representing uh, ICMS and also Digital Humanities. It's our first joint event together, and this is just, uh, we're really happy to be here working on um, together. The Digital Humanities Group, for those of you all who don't know, it uh, is a group at Canisius that supports speakers and workshops and other projects uh, that promote critical thinking and creative work at the intersection of information technology and the arts and humanities. And ICMS is a collaborative effort of faculty from the departments of uh, Classics, English, Fine Arts, History, Philosophy, Religious Studies, and Theology. Uh, that are designed to, uh, that we're working together to enrich the intellectual lives of the Canisius and Buffalo communities through focused study uh, on the vast, rich literary and material cultures of the ancient world and the Middle Ages. So the topic of discussion today provides a perfect intersection for these two groups. Um, our speaker, Dr. Kevin Garsky, will speak to us on the digital transition at the rural sanctuary site of Afternoon Myra in Cyprus. Dr. Garski is the 2018-19 postdoctoral scholar at UB's Institute for European and Mediterranean Archaeology, a position which he took after he received his PhD in anthropology from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2017. Dr. Garski is an anthropolo anthropological archaeologist examining the impact of technology on prehistoric societies and the effect of digital technology on modern archaeological epistemologies. His research in interests include Iron Age Europe, prehistoric technology, digital techniques in archaeology, and 3D digital artifacts, on which subjects he has several recently published articles or journal publications in press. His monograph, Digital Innovations in European Archaeology, is under contract with Cambridge University Press in its elements in European archaeology series. Clearly, our speaker is well poised to talk to us today on the question of how new digital methods can and should be utilized in archaeological research and cultural heritage studies. And I ask you to please join me in welcoming. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to the Institute for Classical and Medieval Studies and the Digital Humanities Group for inviting me to talk to you today, and thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your afternoons to come and listen to me. I will uh, try not to, to bore you with this. Um, now, because this is a kind of joint talk between uh, the Institute and the Digital Humanities Group, I thought it would be good to kind of segment my talk a bit in, in two parts. So uh, to begin with, I'm gonna be introducing you to this extra urban sanctuary uh, at the end of Malara, which I've been working uh, on a project there for the last eight years. Um, this is a site that was occupied for about a thousand years, going back to probably around the eighth century BC, um, up through the, the late Roman period. Um, now, in discussing this site, um, I, I'm going to introduce the way that we have begun to use different types of digital technologies in the field to expand our research, to document the things that we're excavating, and also to make our uh, archaeological finds more available to the public and other stakeholder groups who may be interested in what we're doing. Um, so to give you a little bit of a background here um, and help situate you what we're talking about, this is uh, Cyprus, located here in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, for all of its uh, human prehistory, Cyprus is a crossroads, okay? Um, it's located quite close to Egypt in the Near East, um, in very accessible distance from Greece and, and eventually Italy. Um, and so people have been moving through this place in the Eastern Mediterranean for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and you really see that in the archaeology there. Um, now, the site that I'm going to be talking about is located here, right in the center of the island, um, at the beginning of what's known as the Mezzaria, which is kind of flat plain to the, to the east of the island. 
Um, and this would have been an extremely fertile area in prehistory, and it is still a fertile area today. Now, this red line here actually illustrates the boundary between the Republic of Cyprus and the Turkish Republic of Cyprus, which is an occupied area since 1974, um, when the Turkish army invaded the island. Um, now, in this kind of red zone here, um, there's, there's a, a small area known as the UN border zone. So it's a demilitarized zone um, that is occupied by the, the Greek Republic side, um, but there's, there's no military. It's actually a, a rotating set of UN guards um, that, that patrol the area. So while the site itself is not in this border zone, um, the village very nearby, which our project is based in, is actually in this border zone. And you can look across to the other side, to the occupied Turkish side, and actually see gun emplacements um, on, on hills overlooking the village. So that situates you a little bit spatially. Uh, now, temporally, um, the site that I'm gonna be talking about really started in the Iron Age in Cyprus, okay? So this kind of blocked out area here. Um, the Iron Age in Cyprus is, is really known for the development of these city kingdoms um, spread throughout the island, uh, highlighted here with blue dots. Uh, now, each city kingdom uh, controlled or occupied a, a different part of the island, including its resources, and there was also often conflict uh, between these city kingdoms, kind of and boundaries and territorial uh, disputes. Um, so these red dotted lines here are just approximations of where the end of these city kingdom boundaries would have been. Um, but I do want to point out, you'll note that, that the site of Athena and Malara is right kind of in the center here between a number of different city kingdoms. Um, so its location was probably extremely uh, strategic um, as a place where people would come from either city kingdoms um, and trying to make some larger political point resting on the, their religious beliefs. Uh, now, the site itself was occupied from the Cipro geometric, and I'll get into some more detail of, um, about our evidence for that, all the way down through the Roman period. Now, at this time in Cyprus, these kinds of sanctuaries, these extra urban rural sanctuaries, set in the middle of nowhere, um, not near any type of settlement. Uh, the type of activity is pretty standard across the Iron Age. Uh, so architecture of these sanctuaries are not necessarily what we might think of as uh, traditional classical temples. Okay? The, the architecture is not very grand. Um, it really is an open air courtyard uh, surrounded by a, a peribolosa wall. Um, where you have the, the sanctuary space in the center. Uh, it's often highlighted by different types of pyrotechnic installations, so um, ritual uh, fireplaces or altars where animals that possibly would have been uh, sacrificed and, and burned, um, or other types of, of ritual surrounding that this fire emplacement would have taken place. Um, now this is a, a relief from the nearby settlement of Golgoy, which is just north of this village of Athianu, and I'll show you in a sec on the map. Um, and this actually illustrates Iron Age ritual in progress. So you have a priest here sitting in front of this altar, kind of dip in the center, and a line of uh, people processing in with little figurines or, or statues um, holding them, where they're going to come and dedicate these things to various gods. Um, and so in these types of sanctuaries, you get a whole lot of terracotta and limestone uh, statuary. Uh, on Cyprus, there's no source of marble. So unlike uh, kind of Greek equivalents, there are not marble statues, um, but limestone statues, as well as, as terracotta, which is, for those of you who don't know, a kind of ceramic. So these are basically made out of clay and then fire. Um, now this is an example of a, a sanctuary in Iri Urini um, that is now on the, the occupied side, um, but this was excavated in 1929. And you see here, these are all little terracotta statues that were brought here by people visiting the sanctuary and, and praying in this way to, to the deity. Now, the beginning part of investigations around the Athianu region 
really started way back in the 19th century. Um, so in 1862, um, we get the first actual exploration of sites around Athienu. Um, Edmund uh, Dutrois is actually credited or, or blamed um, for digging a lot of holes around uh, the Athienu region. Um, he never published anything he did at, this, at these sites that, that he investigated. Um, we only know slightly what he's done based on correspondence between him and some of the other members of his team. Um, he says that he investigated a, a temple site um, somewhere south of the, the Athienu village. Um, so here's Athienu here. Um, this is where the site of Athienu Malara is. It seems quite likely that he was digging holes uh, very nearby or actually at the site itself. Um, in some of his sketches, um, he even labels some things Malara, and this is um, a, a statuary of the Cypriot Heracles, um, like Hercules, um, that we actually now see in the Louvre. So a lot of the Cypriot collection at the Louvre currently is from these investigations, and probably, although not for sure, uh, come from our side of Athena Malara. Now, a little bit later in 1870, uh, the Italian-American uh, Chesnola um, was a, an American consul to Cyprus. Uh, he had a great affinity for archaeology and prehistory and, and the past, and also did his own excavations, um, some very unethically, around the region of Athienu. And so um, we again know more or less where he excavated um, in his so-called temples, uh, as well as this settlement site of Golboy, which again is just kind of northeast of the town of Bathyanu. Now for, for a little bit of reference, um, and I know this map is small, but this site now is in the occupied zone, um, and this site is uh, not in the occupied zone. So the line runs right there, just north of the, the village. Uh, and so a lot of these materials that, that Chesnola dug up and, and brought back from his uh, expeditions um, actually became the founding collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And Chesnola became the first director of this museum. Um, so the connection to uh, Athienu and the, the immediate surroundings of the village really have a, a surprisingly large impact on some of these major museums in, say, France and the US, as well as the British Museum. Now, the site of Athienu Malara uh, has been worked on by the Athienu Archaeological Project since 1990 uh, under the direction of Michael Tumazu, who's at uh, Davidson College in, in uh, North Carolina. Um, his family is originally from this, this region and, and this town specifically. Um, and on some surveys, uh, he had some people actually point out directly um, where this site was. Um, these were actually former looters. Um, so throughout the almost 30 years of investigation in this area, uh, AP, as we call it, um, has conducted really massive pedestrian survey of the entire region, as well as more directed excavations of different locales. Um, and so what we have in the, in the valley, this is the larger Malara Valley, um, we have this sanctuary site here, um, as well as a small settlement area um, that really dates to the late Roman into the Byzantine period. Um, we have a number of uh, tombs that date from the Cypro-Archaic all the way to the Hellenistic period, um, here and here. Um, and then we also have some Venetian occupation, um, some kind of industrial activity, um, as well as a, uh, a kind of mortuary site, a cemetery. Um, so the, the valley itself has been used for a variety of reasons for thousands of years. Um, what I didn't even touch on is there's some evidence for um, uh, pre-pottery Neolithic um, uh, extraction sites of, of stone from various areas in this valley as well. Now through this time, the project has kind of developed uh, a very close relationship with the village of Athienu itself. Um, they provide us with some things that we don't even think that we need, like food just brought over to our house every once in a while, um, as well as things we absolutely do need, like cars and space in their uh, new uh, town hall for our labs. Um, so 10 years ago, they, they built a new town hall, 
and actually as part of their town hall, they set up a, a museum with artifacts on loan from the National Museum of things that, that we found at our site. Um, and so the relationship with the village is actually extremely strong, um, and a lot of what we do is, it only happens with their support. Now, the site of the sanctuary itself um, really has been the focus of the excavations for the last 15 or so years. Um, as I mentioned, it dates back to the Cipro geometric period. So we're talking about the, the 9th to 10th centuries, perhaps, um, and was really occupied up until the late Roman period, probably by at least the 4th or 5th century. Uh, what has been extremely challenging about excavating this site is that not only has it been investigated by uh, antiquarian archaeologists in the 19th century, um, and by excavated I mean just holes dug in the ground, um, but there's been significant looting at this site, um, as recently as 2011 actually. Um, so as we dig down and excavate through this site, um, we find a ton of uh, backfilled looters pits. Okay, so imagine people going at night using shovels or even larger machinery to just dig giant holes. They want to find limestone statues that they can sell on the black market. Uh, so we have to kind of contend with that kind of contamination and, and looter behavior as we're actually excavating down. And it, it makes it a little difficult to fully understand what was happening at the site um, during all of these periods. So when I discuss the site in a second, you, you'll notice that we're pretty sure that uh, things started or end at a certain period, uh, but but we're not we're not fully sure just yet, um, and this is one of the reasons why. Now, what we find at this site uh, ranges from a lot of limestone and terracotta statuary, um, over 5,000 pieces, um, and so you see some examples here. This is a limestone chariot with a horse, a terracotta mask, some terracotta uh, warriors on horses, and part of a chariot. Um, we also find, interestingly enough, uh, a number of incised uh, scapula. Um, these would have been sheep, goat, or we can't tell in the archaeological record whether it's sheep or it's goat. Um, but so a sheep or goat scapula, their backbone, um, and they would have incised it for some reason, cut lines into it. Um, we're not sure why. Um, we attribute it to some kind of ritual or divination, um, but, but we don't know the exact reason. Now the earliest phase of the sanctuary um, probably started sometime in the Cipro-geometric period. Um, however, the only kind of datable material we have from that period is a few ceramics. Um, so we think at some point this area was being used, um, but, but we're not sure to what extent. Um, now when we get into the Cipro-archaic period, especially uh, in the 5th and 4th centuries, you see a kind of flourishing of this site. Um, and so, these buildings highlighted in, in blue and red um, are the structures that date to the Cipro-archaic and Cipro-classical periods. Um, and it seems that during this period, the main uh, divinities that were worshipped at this sanctuary um, were more local, um, kind of amalgams. So you have Zeus Amon, um, an example is shown here, as well as Cypriot Heracles, and possibly later Apollo. Um, but in addition to these kind of divinities that are, are um, idolized in these forms, we also have just general votary types, like those terracotta warriors that I, I showed a couple slides back, um, as well as general uh, statuary that, that would have just been dedicated like these divinities. Now, going into the Hellenistic period, um, there's quite a bit of upheaval on the island. Um, Many of the Iron Age city kingdoms uh, stop being used, and you, you start to see uh, Ptolemaic rule on the island. Um, and so many of these rural sanctuaries actually stop being used completely. Um, at the Enumalara seems to have been reorganized and, and changed a little bit, although it still is used as a kind of ritual site, a religious site. Um, so what actually happens is um, they fill in a lot of these older structures um, with we, what we call a hard-packed soil. It's a combination of broken ceramics, old statuary, rocks, dirt, and, and create a new level, and then build their larger peribolos, um, this exterior wall here, surrounding that flat area. Um, so 
if you can see here, this is the kind of uh, southeastern corner here. And although on the map you see that there are walls here, there are no walls here because we haven't excavated down that low yet. Um, so this level covered the existing foundations of the earlier structures and kind of created a new religious space. At the same time, there was also reuse of older statues that were dedicated in the sanctuary. So this is a fully life-size uh, limestone statue that was used in a wall right here. Um, if you can see here, this is a fragment of a limestone statue that is used as a kind of fill in this wall. Uh, and this piece, this Cypriot Heracles, was actually found packed into this, uh, this hard packed layer that was used as a floor. Um, so this face would have just been sticking up. Now also during this period, um, we see the, the development of this kind of altar. Um, now I, I know it's a, it's a strange shape, um, and that's partly due to it being dug into by a looter in 2011. Um, but we see, if you can see here, it's a little bit light, um, there's this basin shape that mirrors the same basin shape on that relief from Golgoy that I showed at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so you get is a, a, a Pise altar, kind of uh, a trampled earth altar um, that would have been continuously burnt and filled in with more burnt earth and then filled in with Pise, then burnt again. And so you get these uh, multiple levels of ash and burnt earth um, that over time created this shape. Um, we also see the development of, of a monumental entrance to the sanctuary. Um, and again, this is a little bit bright here, but we have a reused ashlar block that acts as one of the door jams um, that's still in existence. And then uh, the, the threshold stone, again, unfortunately, was cracked in half by looters um, as they went down through half of this, this entryway. Um, and so we see now a, a, and this was excavated actually just in the past couple of years. Um, before this, we didn't actually have an, ex, uh, an entrance to this sanctuary. Um, so now we at least know where people are kind of funneling through as they enter this, this kind of sacred space. Now, at the same time as this reorganization was happening, there seems to also be a shift in the types of deities that were worshipped at this site. Um, we see a huge number of Cypriot pans um, statuary being dedicated uh, during this period. And this actually is a picture from the excavations in 2017. Um, we found over 50 fragments of different pan statues um, in one small area at the site. Um, we haven't tried to refit them all, uh, but we're dealing with at least 25 statuary individual pans. And this more than doubles the number that we had in the last uh, 25 years of excavation there. Um, there also seems to be a shift from solely dedicated towards uh, male deities to some female deities. So we're finding a, a number of statuary um, of Artemis, uh, as well as a series of, of other female, um, not, not deities specifically, but, but um, females dancing um, in circles, which is a, a fairly common Hellenistic motif on Cyprus. Now the very end of the occupation of this site is still incredibly um, limited. We know from some artifacts that this was being used in some way um, during the very late Roman period into the, the kind of adoption of Christi Christianity. Um, so we have a lamp fragment that has an inscription of or an engraving of a lamp maker in Athens um, from the third century CE AD um, that would have sent their lamps uh, throughout the Mediterranean in the fourth or fifth century. So it seems that someone is using this site, we're not sure for what reason, at least during the fourth or fifth centuries AD. Um, and then we also have this lamp, I don't know if you can see, actually has a cross on it. Um, so there's some kind of Christian activity eventually taking over in this place, but we still don't know the extent of this, um, if there was any kind of change to the architecture, if it was really just someone walking by and they happened to drop their lamp and, and break it, that's also a possibility. Okay, so this is what we've been doing at, at this site, at this sanctuary, uh, for the last almost 30 years. 
Now, when I became affiliated with this project in, in 2012, um, something that I was involved in is helping the project that had been going on for so long kind of transition into this digital age. Um, all across archaeology and various disciplines of archaeology, um, we're starting to adopt different types of technologies and techniques that we see as being helpful for us in recording the archaeological record, in publishing or disseminating the archaeological record, um, or analyzing it. And a lot of this in the last 10 years has come about due to uh, the decrease in cost of software and hardware um, and the increased availability of these techniques for the kind of everyday archaeologists. Um, and so I, I want to walk through some of the ways in which AAP has adopted these larger techniques on our site specifically. Um, and, and I can talk about some of the, the benefits that we immediately see from using this, these technologies, but also some of the, the fears that we have um, about using some of these things without fully understanding them. So the first thing we started to do in 2012 um, was adopt a mobile digital recording strategy. Um, beginning around 2010, 2011, incidentally right when the iPads uh, came out, um, some sites, a very large sites, working at Pompeii for example, started to use uh, tablets for recording in the field. Um, they referred to this as kind of mobile recording or creating born digital data um, so that Traditional field methods and the, the way that archaeology is done still almost at every site is you have forms or written notes that you're taking as you're recording, right? Because archaeology is a destructive discipline, and so we try to record everything to make sure that we don't lose any information after we've dug it out of the ground. Um, so one way to do this is by translating a lot of these uh, analog paper recording techniques to a digital form. Um, so we have field notes, and again, this is a bit blurry, but um, one staple of the archaeologists in the field is taking field notes, copious field notes, about everything that you're doing, everything you're digging out of the ground, how the soil feels, sometimes even what the weather is like. Um, this can all be done on a mobile uh, device, on a tablet. Uh, the benefits of this is that we now have this in immediate digital form. So at the end of the season, all of the field notes are in digital form and you can easily search them. Um, you can go back through various days by not having to page through um, you know, individual notebooks looking for a specific day when you excavated this because you can't remember. Uh, it also allows us to insert other types of media into the field notes themselves. So taking pictures with the iPad itself and being able to insert, insert those directly into that day's field notes. It also allows us access to our digital database. So after a project has been working for this long, you have an incredible amount of information about individual trenches, um, larger areas of the site, artifacts that you've excavated, um, stratigraphic units, which are the kind of layers that, that uh, create the site itself. Um, and so we have access to this database right on the, the tablet itself. And it allows people who are working in the field to enter this information directly into a database um, and also get that information out so that they can use it while they're excavating. Uh, so we found that th this is incredibly useful. Now, a problem with it is that like any other technology um, that archaeologists use, for the most part, was not designed for this purpose. It was not designed to be in the 110 degree heat of a Cypriot summer. Um, we have problems with overheating tablets. Uh, there's also a problem with actually writing on the tablet in real time. So on an excavation, you're in the dirt, um, trying to type out with one hand, or pulling up a keyboard and trying to type is a bit difficult. Um, so the logistics of the adoption of this technology uh, are still being worked out. Um, but there is, overall, throughout the discipline of archaeology, a push to try to uh, utilize these tablets and these mobile recording devices in the field so that we have all of this information in digital form of media. Now, another technique that, that we've been using is what's known as computational photogrammetry. 
Okay, photogrammetry is simply based on the principles of stereoscopic vision. Okay, we have our two eyes, and they have overlapping fields of vision. Um, where those fields of vision overlap, we can see in 3D, in three dimension. It's a similar principle to photogrammetry. You have a lot of photographs that overlap slightly, and we're able to create a 3D structure um, from those overlapping images. Now, this relies on a lot of uh, computer algorithms, um, specifically something called structure from motion, um, which is the most popular algorithm that we use in, in photogrammetry now. But it allows us to, um, in the field, take a bunch of photographs like this. Um, so this is an image of, uh, on, on the software that I use, all these blue squares uh, represent where a photo was taken from. And this is on part of our site. Uh, this creates what's known as a point cloud, basically a three-dimensional cloud of points, of, of uh, spatial points, um, that then create a 3D structure of whatever was in all of those images. And so we get part of the, the sanctuary wall here in three dimensions. Now these we found to be extremely useful. So in addition to just having a 3D model on your desktop or your laptop, being able to you know, manipulate it and spin it around and zoom in and out, um, which is always cool, uh, we found that you can create basically 2D image from these 3D models. Um, so these are known as orthophotos. Um, and essentially, it's taking the 3D model and giving you a 2D slice of it. And it, it provides an image that you never would have been able to take if you were just in the field taking a photograph. So this is an example from another site I work with, actually in Indiana. Um, and this is just a one meter by two meter excavation trench down. Okay, so not a lot of space in there. Um, but using the 3D model that's produced, we're actually able to get essentially photographs of all of these side walls here, all these profile walls, um, that would have been extremely skewed if we tried to take a photograph from on the surface. Uh, so this has immense benefits for uh, mapping. Uh, archaeologists, just like they record everything in the field, um, map everything. We want to record the, the spatial relationship of everything that we've excavated, where we found everything, all of the architecture, um, or other types of features that we're finding. Using these 3D models and the 2D images that come out of these 3D models, um, we're able to input them directly into our geographic information systems, these computer softwares that allow us to kind of organize all of our geographic information, all of our spatial information. Um, and instead of being in the field and mapping by hand um, every single point of a rock, um, we're able to have it in digital form and just trace out each individual rock in digital form. Um, so it, it ends up saving us a considerable amount of time translating the analog to the digital. Now another technique that, that we've been using a lot um, is what's known as structured light scanning. Um, so this is a principle somewhat similar to, to laser scanning. Um, but essentially, you're using the principles of triangulation. And if you see on this video, it's, this projector is projecting a series of light strips onto this artifact in front of it. Depending on how those light strips are displaced on the surface of the artifact, um, smaller cameras pick up that displace, displacement and, and create this point cloud, the same kind of thing we saw with, with photogrammetry. So essentially, we can create 3D models of the artifacts that we're excavating out of the ground. Uh, again, the benefits of this uh, are, are pretty extreme. So accessibility. All of the artifacts that we excavate from the sanctuary or any part of, of uh, the excavations in Cyprus are, are all stored at the Larnaca Museum uh, in Cyprus. So if we want to look at any of them, we have to fly to Cyprus, um, ask permission to have them taken out of the storeroom, um, which is extremely crowded, and we only have maybe three or four artifacts at a, at a time of you know almost 5,000. Having them in digital form allows us to investigate these uh, at an exact scale um, from our couches at home with our desktops. Uh, it's not the same thing as having it in your hand, um, and any archaeologist will cop to that. Uh, 
but it provides a number of affordances that just a photograph does not provide to an archaeologist. Um, it also allows for more detailed analysis of these artifacts without any uh, destructive properties. So every time you touch an artifact, um, there's potential for something going wrong, right? Uh, especially if, if you're not wearing gloves. Um, so doing this, especially with fragile artifacts, allows the artifacts to stay safe um, while still being able to conduct research on them. Um, there's also the possibility of bringing together collections that are maybe in more than one museum, um, which, as we talked about with the Chesnola collection um, or the, the excavations by the French uh, in the 19th century, these are distributed to various museums throughout the world even. Um, and there's no possibility in the near future of having all of those artifacts come together. Um, but if we can have them at least digitally and bring them together um, in a digital form, uh, it, it is maybe one step towards that. Um, at the same time, we're still trying to figure out what is the best way to actually use these 3D models of artifacts and disseminate them to people. <clears throat> Some of these, excuse me, are really large in their file sizes. So we're working on strategies to be able to disseminate these models and make them usable by other researchers or the public um, in a way that doesn't crash your computer every time you open it. Uh, so one way is, is a publication that we currently have under review, um, which is a fully digital artifact catalog. So traditional, traditionally, archaeologists use a, a printed catalog of their artifacts from their excavation or their site um, as a way to disseminate this information to other researchers. Um, so we're using that same model, but making it in a fully digital form. And instead of having an illustration or a photograph of the artifact, we have the 3D model embedded right into essentially a PDF. Um, at the same time, these models are accessible through an open access uh, data publisher that we work with called Open Context. Um, and so by allowing different platforms to be used to access this material, uh, it really kind of opens the door for ways to disseminate this, this uh, data in, in ways that archaeologists haven't been able to make access of or use it access of. Now, other possibilities for these 3D models are using them in more educational contexts. Uh, a lot of students in universities, especially if this is an intro archaeology class or an intro, intro anthro class, um, don't have access to actually holding or manipulating artifacts that were just excavated. Uh, what we can do is create virtual reality opportunities for students and the public to interact with these artifacts or with these excavations. Um, so they get more of an experience than just staring at someone talking with a PowerPoint, which I know the irony of me saying that while I'm doing exactly that. Um, but I, I had the opportunity um, when I was teaching at Marquette University in, in Milwaukee um, to utilize their uh, lab for virtual, uh, excuse me, a, an immersive virtual reality lab. It's essentially a classroom of 30 students down here. Um, and there's a six-sided uh, virtual reality box that um, all you need to do is put on glasses and you can project um, a kind of virtual reality environment into this classroom. Um, and so I set up essentially a scene um, of part of the excavation at, at Malara um, to talk the students through excavation processes and what we were seeing in the ground. These were strategies for how we were excavating. Now, it can't uh, take the place of actually being in the field and experiencing an excavation. But it's at least a step further um, outside of just sitting in a classroom and listening to someone lecture at you. Uh, there's also extreme potential for these things to be used in heritage preservation or enhancing museum uh, visitor experiences. Um, a lot of people find museums extremely boring. Uh, and at times, I don't blame you. Um, there are potential for utilizing these new digital techniques to create a more interactive museum experience for people. Um, allowing people to manipulate 3D models on their phones or tablets that they have with them um, to look at them in, in a, a closer way than just behind a, a pane of glass. 
Now, another aspect of larger digital archaeology that AAP has been involved with um, is making use of, of open access data or trying to make our data open access. So a larger trend in the sciences, but also the humanities um, and, and social sciences, is the idea of open science uh, to provide all of your data, all of your information as a researcher um, available to everyone. Um, so that doesn't mean not making interpretations and coming to conclusions based on your own data, um, but it allows other researchers to, say, double check your work or um, provide their own interpretations or alternate interpretations um, from what you're seeing. So one such site is known as Open Context. Um, and this is, again, a, a data publishing site that, that we're partnering with um, to try to see the potential for publishing our, our 3D models. And so I've been working with them to develop their 3D viewer in a, in a way that, that is uh, user-friendly for researchers and archaeologists, but also for the public. Um, now, these kind of sites are trying to make use of a larger concept uh, known as linked open data. Um, this is an idea that uh, researchers, not just in the sciences, but in the humanities and social sciences, um, can do a better job of using what we call the semantic web, um, of connecting up our data across sites, across regions, uh, even across disciplines. Um, so the idea of the semantic web is that every piece of data, whether it's uh, a recording from an excavation or a 3D model, um, has an associated set of keywords that identify it um, in a standard way across the entire web. Um, so that this site of, of Malara has standard definitions that it's a sanctuary, um, it has dates in the Cipro geometric, and the Cipro archaic, and the Cipro classical, Hellenistic. So in theory, if anyone searched on some database, show me all of the sanctuaries that date to the Cipro archaic, this site would show up. Okay? The idea of linked open data is doing this on a much, much, much larger scale. And so you have projects like this one called Pleiades, um, as well as Periodo, which are trying to do this standardized uh, locations in the classical world, in, in uh, the case of Pleiades, or time periods in the classical world in terms of periodo. Um, across regions, across countries, even across disciplines of archaeology, um, we may use different time periods to talk about the same chronological period. And so by using standard forms like this, it allows projects and data to talk uh, across each other or to each other. Um, so there's an extreme potential for um, making the most of the data that we've already collected in archaeology, as well as the, the information that we'll continue to collect uh, as excavations continue to go on. Uh, now, there, these new technologies are not without their problems. One significant issue that I see uh, with archaeologists taking up this, uh, these new techniques of 3D scanning and 3D modeling is that many archaeologists don't know how we go from digging something up in the ground to having a pretty 3D model that we can play around with on our desktop. Um, this is something what we call the black boxing, uh, the technology. It's an idea that technology, a lot of technology, has become so complicated that we actually don't know what's going on behind the veil inside this black box. Uh, we only know that there's an input and there's an output. Uh, and for the most part, we don't really care what's going on in the black box because we have a pretty 3D model that comes out of it. Um, but if we start to use things like 3D models in archaeology um, more and more, and they almost replace, in some sense, the, the things that we do with the physical artifacts, um, there could be some issue. Uh, by not understanding that process. So I want to just demonstrate a few issues that, that we notice by using our structured light scanner and, and scanning some of these artifacts. Uh, the creator, the user of the uh, scanning system, whatever you're using, has a great deal of influence on the final product. So this is the same artifact scanned three different times um, with 
slight changes to the white balance on uh, the camera that we use to, to collect the images. Um, as you see, one is red, one is the normal color, and one is bright blue. Okay? Uh, this is the same head scanned in just different locations. Uh, one is near a window, one is away from a window. And one is much brighter, one has more of a yellowish tint to it. Uh, now, if you never came into contact with the original artifact that was used to create this 3D model, how would you know what the proper color of the model was? Uh, how would you know that this Heracles head was not blue? And you'd ask a bunch of questions like, why is this limestone blue? Uh, but this is a potential problem if we're not aware of what's happening inside these black boxes. Um, another example here, this is a terracotta figurine from, from our site. Um, and this is a photograph of that, the backside of that figurine. And this is a 3D model uh, that we made of that figurine. Now, you might not be able to see it with this projector, uh, but there's a couple of uh, thumbprints on the back of this terracotta, right? So this was basically a piece of clay that was molded and so someone was pushing on the back of it to, to make the mold of the, the front um, and left their fingerprints in there. And that was fired and they're, they're preserved now. Uh, this 3D model uh, does not have those fingerprints. So again, if we were to only interact with this 3D model of this terracotta figurine, we would never know that there were fingerprints on the back of that. Uh, it may seem like a small thing, uh, to not be able to access that small amount of information. But when you're talking about the entire archeological record and this translation to digital means, um, we have to consider exponentially how we're, how we're losing parts of, of uh, the original information, the original data, as we're translating into uh, digital form. Now some of the largest issues that, that archeologists are dealing with in this translation to kind of digital archaeology, um, center around ownership of data. Uh, there's still a lot of debates going on with institutions um, and countries, Department of Antiquities of countries, about who really owns the 3D model of an artifact that was excavated in this country and, is, uh, and belongs to a, a particular museum. Um, does the license belong to the country? Does it belong to the museum? Does it belong to the person who created the model? Um, these are big issues that are, are, are not being figured out just yet. Uh, we also have to come to terms with managing all of this digital data in the long term. For a very long time, archaeologists really just had to consider Okay, we need a storeroom that will house our artifacts or we'll deposit them at the museum. Um, we need a, a bookshelf that will put all of our field notes in and a map drawer that will put our maps in. Okay, that was basically it. And we hoped that those, those rooms were locked and no one had access to them. Now we need to consider how do we uh, curate and manage all of this digital data for a very long period of time to make sure that it's usable uh, outside of just the, the five years or ten years that you may be working on a project. Um, you want to make sure that the information you're collecting is available to everyone for a long, long, long time. Uh, we also have to figure out how can or should we use 3D models um, and share them with other researchers and the public. Uh, 3D printing has become more and more common and accessible to people. Um, and you're starting to see uh, 3D artifact models being printed for use in museums or, or other things like uh, the famous Palmyra Arch um, that was, of course, the city was destroyed um, by ISIS and uh, they used photos from the site, earlier photos from the site, to reconstruct um, part of the architecture from the site um, in a way to kind of bring it back. Uh, but this, again, brings up a lot of issues of, of ownership, of kind of colonial co-option of, uh, in this case, you know, Near Eastern um, uh, prehistory um, for political purposes. Um, and so we need to come to terms with how these 3D models can or should be used um, 
before interaction with the public. Um, there's also then a problem within the discipline itself. Um, now some of these technologies that I've talked about are accessible financially. Um, so photogrammetry, you really just need a, a pretty good quality digital camera and software and the know-how, how to create a 3D model. Um, the structured light scanner that I talked about is uh, you know, over $15,000. There's a lot of archaeology going on out there. Not all of them can afford to purchase a structured light scanner. Uh, so what we're starting to see is that there are projects that have the financial resources to purchase these technologies and to be at the forefront of uh, utilizing these techniques in the discipline, and projects that do not have uh, the capabilities to do that. Uh, we have to figure out if, if that, that gap is going to continue to widen or if there's a way that we can kind of keep that gap um, closer and, and allow for all of the data that's being collected to actually um, uh, be utilized by, by all archaeologists. Well, I want to thank, again, everyone for coming and, and spending some of your afternoon with me. Um, obviously, I want to thank a lot of the, the funding bodies that have um, allowed us to do a lot of this research and, and uh, the directors of the Afghanu Archaeological Project for um, bringing me on and, and working with me. Um, I'm also going to have a little plug here for a conference that I'm organizing uh, at the beginning of April, April 6th and 7th, um, at University of Buffalo. Um, critical archaeology in the digital age. We're having 17 speakers, international and national speakers, uh, coming to talk about a lot of these issues that I, that I just mentioned, um, how we're critically using these digital technologies in archaeology, and how we should kind of move forward in this. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take questions. In producing some of these two and three D things, yep. are you able to also preserve or accurately the scale so the thing you can like overlap and say, you know, does this match one, this one, the same size? The yes. Same size? So depending on the type of technology that you're using to create the three D model, uh, you can do that, and it's kind of built in. So the structured light scanner um, creates what we call absolute geometry because it's measuring the surface of the, the artifact in relation to the scanner itself. So the 3D models that we create using this technique are geometrically accurate to the original. So um, you can take multiple pieces and put them together digitally and see if they either fit or they're the same thing. Yeah. Now photogrammetry, uh, because it's, it's uh, based on the images themselves, um, it's only accurate in scale to itself. So it doesn't live in the kind of real world spatial sense. Um, so you need to add in the, the dimensions there. So when we're doing it in the field, we use control points on the ground that we know their uh, you know, actual coordinates, whatever coordinate system we're using. Um, and we feed that into the program and, and uh, create the accurate models that way. Yeah. Because Cyprus is considered such a wonderful crossroads with yeah. the ancient Near East and maybe Egypt and also with Greece, mm -hmm. do you find any artifacts that are from different cultures? You mentioned the Roman land, but is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, so uh, most of the material culture is a kind of amalgam of everything. Um, so I can let's go back a little bit here. Um, so the, the styles um, are a mix. So you, you see some. Um, some Greek uh, uh, styles, like this, for example. Um, but the arm, the left arm up, in Greece it's usually the right arm. Um, simple things like that. Headgear is more uh, uh, traditionally Cypriot, a local Cypriot kind of headgear. Um, we have, this is uh, an example of like an Egyptianizing um, statue. So if you see from the other side, it has the headgear that comes down in a kind of traditional Egyptian form. Uh, we find like small Egyptian pendants uh, and a lot of Phoenician influences, like the, the terracotta um, statue with the fingerprint, or the finger, 
um, on the back of it um, is probably a Starte, um, which is a, a Phoenician goddess. Um, so it's kind of always a mix, yeah. That's so exciting. And I'm glad you went back to this slide. Is that an offering vessel? Yeah, right the here. Bottom? No, the oh. lower back? What is that? So that's, that's actually a lamp. Yeah, so this is this is more of an archaic lamp. So the, the lamp styles also change through time. Um, they become closed later on, um, but but this is like an open lamp. Like that. Yeah. So you see a little bit of black there. Okay. That's like where the the it would have burnt. So it's not really a digital <clears throat> question about digital technology, but um, can you say, can you? Say, Speak a little more about um, the problem of looting in the modern era, and because I, I think a lot of us are probably ha have a sort of a almost adolescent curiosity, and um, yeah, seems seems darkly exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, like what is the? Do you, do you get a sense of what the market looks like? What are their objectives when they are looting? What are they leaving behind? Um, to what extent are they knowledgeable about what they're looting or? Yeah, so uh, in terms of, I'll, I'll start with the last question first. In terms of knowledgeable, they're extremely knowledgeable. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Tomazu came across this site um, because he was you know, investigating around the village and a known looter said, oh, come here, I'll show you something. And he was just walking in a, an empty field and like stuck a stick down and it's like, it's here. And that's where the sanctuary ended up being. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so th they know what they're doing. Um, they probably are, uh, they know the right depths to even dig to, um, which is lucky in some ways for us because um, while the, the, depending on where you are on the site, a good meter to a meter and a half is disturbed by looting activity. Um, below that um, is usually untouched. So some of the earlier phases that um, were covered over by this kind of hard pack fill um, are usually not dug into by the leaders. Uh, but sometimes we'll find knives or shovels at the bottom, um, like really rusted, I mean, and maybe 50 to 70 years old. Uh, but mm -hmm. So sometimes they leave those behind too. But so in what they're really looking for are full statues. Um, so in these looters pits, um, one reason why we excavate them still scientifically. We try to excavate the pit when we come across it as one single thing and make sure we get it all out so that we're not contaminating the, re the surrounding uh, archaeological stratigraphy. Um, but we'll find fragments, a lot of fragments, of statuary um, because for whatever reason they're not good enough to be sold for anything else. Uh, also a lot of headless uh, statues because um, they're cutting off the heads and just wanting to and with the experience of looting at these sites, but I study Egyptian Christianity, and a lot of the looting that happens in Egypt now is extremely dangerous. Um, and you know, people are getting killed when their pits are collapsing and so on and so forth. You're not finding so that extent. No, sense. and in terms of the pit collapsing, they're not quite going deep enough okay. where it should be an issue. Yeah. Uh, I've heard in the past, uh, in the recent past, they also use machinery, okay. um, and they have a pretty elaborate system of like uh, uh, kind of lookouts mm -hmm. um, down parts of the road because uh, the, the site itself is in a valley that's an agricultural valley, um, so it's it's just fields surrounding it. So during the night, especially, you're not really going to get anyone out there. Um, but in case someone drives by on the nearby road, um, they have kind of lookouts set up. Um, in terms of other types of danger, I aware of any other uh, you know, fighting over certain parts of it. It certainly gives urgency to the work, because for each passing year that we're not doing this, this, this is laid open the potential for vandalism. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, and again, this isn't necessarily to talk about looting, but <clears throat> another dimension that probably should be considered as well, is that these are local people. Um, a lot of times they're looting to sell it to get money. Uh, 
we have to then have a discussion about the value of cultural heritage preservation from the archaeologist's point of view uh, to this villager who is just trying to make money um, and, and support them and their families. Uh, so it, it becomes a little stickier than just um, they're doing terrible things in their backyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, we can continue the conversation. We have uh, a spread uh, of uh, food and, and refreshments over there. So I would say, by all means, if you have additional questions for Dr. Garski, why not stick around and um, get something to eat, and uh, we'll continue the conversation here for a little while.